good? <laughs> Hallelujah. And he's good all the time. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning again. Hallelujah. Isn't this a great day to be alive in Jesus? In spite of everything that's going on in the world, thank God that you can have a relationship with the God of heaven that can keep you and protect you. Amen. Especially with what's happening over in the Middle East and what's taking place with the nation of Israel. Listen, saints, we need to pay attention to that. Amen. That's, that's, that's biblical property being fulfilled right before our very eyes. And, and listen, what happens with Israel is going to determine what's going to happen with the rest of the world. Don't, don't, don't think for one moment God ain't on Israel's side. And don't think for one moment Israel going to lose this battle. Amen. Hallelujah. I was telling somebody that, yeah, this week, I said, if, you, if we would just pause and just take a map and look at the Middle East and look at the nation of Israel and see all the countries around it are Arab countries. It's the smallest thing in the middle of all those Arab countries. And they have been trying to wipe out Israel for centuries. It would stand to reason from logic that with all those nations all around it, all they got to do is close in and engulf them and it'd be gone. They've tried that. Time and time again, they've tried that. And they're still there. <laughs> not by might, not by their power, but by God Almighty. <laughs> By God Almighty. And as we watch what unfolds with them, keep your eye on the horizon. Because God is showing us what he told us we need to look for to let us know that his coming is near. Amen. He says, these things you will see, but the end will not yet be. But they are signs. They, the question was, how we know when you're coming? Jesus says, here you look, wars and rumors of wars. Did you know that the same weekend that Israel was attacked, there was an earthquake in Afghanistan. 2,400 people lost their lives. He said, earthquakes in diverse places. Pestilence and diseases. There's, there's locusts in, in Kenya. There's disease in, in Bangladesh. There's pestilence around the world that the news ain't even talking about. Because it's not newsworthy. But all these things are happening even now as you and I sit here. And then the rise of immorality in our country is no mistake. It's all a part of what God says that the love of many will act cold in these last days. Y'all, y'all, you, you listen. The headlines is preaching the word. And those who know the word are paying attention. Amen. And all that is signaling to you and I not to sit back and relax. That's not the signal. The signal is urgency. We need to be intentional about telling folks around us that Jesus is alive and well. We need to be urgent about those people in our lives that ain't saved. Got to stop to be, you got to stop being afraid to tell them and stop being embarrassed and, and be worried about whether they're going to re reject you or not. Because time is drawing short and it ain't tuned. See, he's coming soon and we don't know the day nor the hour. But we need to listen, if you love them, if you care about them, you need to tell them that they need to get to know Jesus Because when that time comes, <laughs> they're going to snatch those who belong to him and leave those that don't. Hallelujah. And I don't want to be held accountable for anybody in my circle of influence getting left behind. Amen. I need to tell them about Jesus. Listen, let's, let's keep praying for Israel. We stand with Israel. We, 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 are, we recognize God's sovereignty and anointing upon the nation of Israel and call. So we are stand. So the Bible says he blesses those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
Amen. So we need to keep praying that God's will would be accomplished and God's purpose would be seen and God's glory would be manifested in these events that are taking place right in our own history and in our own lives. Amen. Amen. Well, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Colossians. We're going to continue in our series. We've been in a series for the last three weeks. This is our fourth message on spiritual warfare. God has kind of directed me to talk about this from a, in a different way. And we've been talking not just spiritual warfare in terms of what it is, but we've been breaking it down based on the components that are involved in spiritual warfare so that we as a body of believers, as saints, and as I believe that's what God wants us to know, to know how these components operate, who are, who's for us and who's against us. And so we've talked about angels and we laid out what the angels are, the cherubims and the seraphims and why they're here and what their roles and responsibilities are. We talked about demons, hallelujah, and how, how, who they are, where they came from and how they came to be and what their role, two, two functions, two, two, two particular functions of demons, either possess you or oppress you. That's their goal. That's the goal of demons, either possess you or oppress you. If you don't know the Lord, they, are, they possess you. Hallelujah. They get into your mind and your spirit. They control your life. They possess you. And if you know the Lord and you're not obedient to the Lord, they will oppress you. They will keep you from letting your light shine. They will keep you from being a witness. They'll keep you from displaying the power of God. And Bible reminds us that they have no more power over us than what we let them have. Because he has given us authority. Amen. Amen. And what we have failed to do is exercise our authority. We've allowed the enemy to create fear and make us believe that his fear is greater than God's power. And listen, we need to walk in the authority of God because he has not given us the spirit of fear. Amen. Perfect love cast out all fear. Amen. And so we talked about demons. And then last week, a couple of weeks, last week, we talked about the devil. Amen. They talk about who he is, what he is. We, we talked about his names and how his names describe who he was. If you had a chance to listen to any of those messages, they're online. They're on our website at cleanyourchurch.com, and they're also on our YouTube channel at ECF Online on YouTube. So if you didn't get a chance to hear those, you can go back and, and check those out and listen to them. We're continuing. We got two more messages in this series before we move to our next series. And today we're going to start a series of uh, two-part me uh, message on the theme, the occult and non-Christian religions. Because see, as we talk about the tactics that the devil uses, and the Bible tells us that we're not ignorant of his devices, we need to understand that these things that we're going to be talking about in the next two weeks are the devices that the devil uses to get believers off kilter, to get them to deny or even question the Word of God, to get them to compromise the Word of God in their life. Because when we talk about some of these practices, some of us are involved in them, and we're thinking there's no big deal about them, but they are weakening us spiritually because we tend to want to have them and then worship God. And the problem is, you don't understand that as long as you'll dabble in those things and you say to yourself, well, it ain't no big deal. I just check it out every once in a while. But you don't understand it is hindering the power that God wants to manifest in your life and it's causing you to compromise your faith. And everybody around you that you tell that do that question and wonder about the, 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 the sincerity of your faith because you do the things that, that, that you think are okay but they're really devices of the devil to hinder you and keep you from experiencing the power of God in your life. We're going to talk about them. Because some of these practices I'm going to mention, some of us are practicing in the church. Hello, lights. And so we, we, want to get, we want to talk about that, okay? So we're going to be talking about the occult and non-Christian religion. Two-part messages. Part one, we're going to be talking about today. So you got it, Colossians chapter 2. Uh, so while you're, if you got that, uh, let me give you our quote for the week. I'm not going to read you. Let me give you our quote for the week, and then I'm going to have you stand and read our scripture, okay? Here's the quote for the week. This is a good one. This, this, this is definitely related to what we're going to be talking about. If the devil can't hinder you with difficulties, if the devil can't hinder you with difficulties, He's going to choke you with distractions. If the devil can't hinder you with difficulties, 
He'll choke you with distractions, that little stuff, that stuff that just gets on your nerves, that stuff that just drives you crazy. He just keeps the damn stuff break down. Things don't turn out right. You thought that was, that little stuff, the little distractions that make you make the excuse not to come to church on Sunday because you had to stay up too late last night because of distractions that happened the night before. You can't get up in morning for quiet time because of distraction. You can't pray because your mind is all messed up because somebody says something to you like, so you can't pray now. So that's a distraction. The distraction that makes you not want to read the word because I can't understand it. Because when you read it, it don't make sense. But you don't understand it. You ain't feeding your mind. You're feeding your spirit. But you, your distraction makes you stop because you don't understand. But you won't come to church or Bible study to learn. Distraction. Make you too tired. Party too long. If he can't hinder you with difficulty, he going to choke you with distractions. Amen? And some of the things we're going to be talking about, especially as we get into these subjects, are distractions. The devil uses to keep you from experiencing the power that God wants to display in your life. Got Colossians chapter 2? Let's stand. Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 6. Take your Bible, hold it up high. Serve the devil notice. Shake it at him. When you do that, that tells him you know how to use it. Say with a very loud voice, I have the victory. And the victory is where? In my life as I apply God's word because the application of the word that gives me victory, not just the knowing of it. Amen. Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, reading from the King James Version of the Bible. It says this, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, he says, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. And you are complete in him. You don't need to add anything to it now that you got him. You ain't missing nothing now that you got him. You ain't lost nothing now that you got him. You are complete in him who is the head of all principalities and powers. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 12, 13, just a word of warning from Jesus in 22 and 23, says for false prophets and false Christ and false prophets will arise and now sign and show signs and wonders to deceive if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. I have told you all things before God ain't left you ignorant of what the enemy is trying to do. The reason you ignorant is because you ain't reading your word. The text would warn us that these things are coming to keep us and to hinder us from distractions. And Colossians, as Paul warns us, as Jesus warns us, reminds us that we need to be careful because the enemy will want to use these things in our lives to keep us from being who God wants us to be. Colossians 8, again, reading from the New Living Translation, puts it again, let no one capture you with empty philosophies or high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of the world rather than from Christ. And what we're going to be talking about is high-sounding nonsense that the devil wants to use to keep you from experiencing the power God has for you. Take your seat. Because that's exactly what the devil uses. It sounds smart. It sounds intellectual. It sounds like it makes sense. But as Paul says in the New Living, it's high-sounding nonsense. 
and a lot of us are carried away by high-sounding nonsense. A lot of us are being led astray into spiritual eternity without Christ, believing in high-sounding nonsense. So this is part one of this message, two-part message, and today we're going to talk about the occult. Part one, we're going to deal with the occult. Let me ask you something. If I were to ask you a question, if I were to ask you if you could give me the address and the phone number to the mafia, what would you say? <laughs> See, probably, I don't know, right? Probably you, it is, and, and listen, as a matter of fact, I seriously doubt that you can go anywhere in this country and find a building that has a label of mafia headquarters on it. Because what you need to understand about the mafia, that the mafia is an invisible system of well-camouflaged evil. Are you with me there? Many who function in the mafia are legitimate businessmen by the day, but are hitmen at night. By the day, many of them dress in suits and sign business papers, but at night, many of them make drug deals because the goal of the mafia is that it is an invisible system designed to promote evil, often camouflaged by good. And such is the occult. It's a system the devil uses. That on the top, on the surface, it looks like it's good. It looks innocent. It don't look like it ain't nothing wrong with it. But it's camouflaged by good with the motive of pr promoting, and and operating, and 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 even displaying and and demonstrating evil. So what is the occult? I did a lot of reading and research. You know what the biggest challenge of this message was? trying to say what not to say. <laughs> try, try, try to get it down just to, just to get to the point of what I need to tell you because there's so much stuff in this study. But listen, uh, so the, what is it? In the Western world, the occult usually evokes ide uh, evil ideas of evil connotations associated with witchcraft and sorcery, uh, also those summoning the dead and those are doing ritual sacrifices. Yet in some Eastern cultures, however, when it comes to the occult, religion and occultism are frequently blended together in a normally neutral form. Western occult beliefs pertain to secret philosophies, such as Hellenistic magic or, uh, or uh, alchemy, uh, combined with Jewish mysticism. Occult practitioners, as they often call themselves, are supposedly gifted people with powers and knowledge that are available only to a special individual or a particularly intelligent person. Occultists or spiritualists, as they're often known as, seek secret wisdom, and usually they seek the wisdom to what they consider the key to eternal life. The word occult just simply means hidden. Occult means hidden, that which is hidden. So as we think about the issue of the occult, whether you realize it or not, and in my research I come to find out that under this guise of ignorance, occult, uh, there's an occult boom in this country that's going on right now. Many of the cult, uh, listen, the, the boom today is prevalent and widespread by the practice of one particular thing, astrology. I'm going to talk about that later on in more detail. Astrology, particularly your horoscope. It ex listen, astrology extended way, from, uh, way back from Satan and witchcraft and now has ended up at the edge of science started in the olden days with Satanism and witchcraft. But today, it's, it's considered a part of science. Are you with me today? And listen, and, and one out of five Americans have confessed that they believe in astrology. That they, they believe in it and they practice it. 
adherence to other forms of the occult practice are those who believe in transcendental meditation. 4% of Americans practice transcendental meditation. 3% of Americans practice yoga. Some Christians too. 2% of Americans practice mysticism. And 1% of Americans practice Eastern religions. Now, you might think those percentages are awful, awful small, but when you, when you extrapolate it to a population of over 350, close to 400 million people, that's a lot of folks who worship these particular things in our culture and promote and practice them. Matter of fact, in my research, I found that occult book sales have doubled in the last four years. More than 800 different titles were involved, and the occult movement has its own magazine. It's called the Occult Trade Journal. And Doubleday, book publisher, said that under, when it comes to their new book titles under the, cult, under the occult, the membership for those books have zoomed to over 100,000 people in the last two years. And there is a especially... Uh, 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 I guess, popular bookstore uh, called the Metaphysical Books Bookstore or the Metaphysical Center in San Francisco. That's where most people go to get their books. They sell over $12,000 worth of books a month related to the occult. And they offer courses at this bookstore on, palm, on psalmetry, which is reading palms, on reincarnation, on astral projection, on numerology, and others. And, and, and the bookstore also sells ritual robes, amulets, incense, and crystal balls. Listen, and, and, and in this research, just recently, I was just reading about um, the, uh, the Exorcist. You know, there's a new movie coming out, a remake of the movie called The Exorcist, right? This time it got two girls in it rather than one. Amen. Well, then, well the first one that came out, Back in the 70s, they said in one week it made over $70 million. And then it also implied that the title, the book that is titled The Exodus, has over 10 million copies in print that people have read and have purchased. And come to find out that many of our major colleges and universities offer credited courses in the occult. That our students, our children can take a class on, in college and get credit for it on the occult. Not on the Bible, on the occult. Uh, There's no courses in college that you can take credit for on the Bible. But you get, get credit for taking a class on the occult. Why is the question. That most folks ask, why are people so interested in the ego? Why are people drawn to the ego? What is it, the fascination about why people dabble or get involved in occult practices? One primary reason, people want to know about the future. Whether good or bad, they want to know about the future. And if something offers them the opportunity to know about the future, they're willing to pay for the prediction. That's why palm readers and psychics and numerologists have great followings even to this day. And even certain practices such as the Ouija board, people still buy and purchase and still listen and follow practices with the Ouija board or with tea, reading tea, what they call tea leaves, the Japanese practice of reading tea leaves to tell somebody's future or to tell what's going to happen in, in their lives. And a new thing called I Chen, which is a, a form of casting lots. And they have a book that however the sticks fall, you read the patterns of the sticks in the book and it tell you what's going to happen in your life now and in the future. And these, all of these three practices have huge followings and people are buying these materials and using these materials every day. Meanwhile, the, uh, this says that astrology is enjoying an unprecedented boom, according to the American Federation of Astrologists, who boasts right now they have well over thousands of members in their federation. Meanwhile, and this is one of the things I thought was very interesting, the fortune tellers, the Gypsy fortune tellers have, joined, have been joined by government-sponsored think tanks with the names of Rad Corporation and Hudson Institution, who partner now with fortune tellers to help 
their people feel comfortable about their present and their future. Going on, it said industry and academia lent respons- have, have, have lent respectability to stargazing uh, with such organizations as the Commission on 2000, sponsored by the prestigious American Association of Arts and Science and the Institute of the Future, who formed a consortium uh, 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 which, which is sponsored by companies like Monsanto, DuPont, and Chase Manhattan. You have major corporations involved in promoting occult practices in their businesses and with their employees, not just here, but also overseas. One of the interesting things that has come up recently is the crystal ball has been replaced by the computer. Instead of soothsayers making prophecies, we get system theorists with world models, statistical, statistical projections, and extrapolated scenarios that they get from the computer to tell people that if certain scenarios happen in your life, this is how your life is going to turn out from a computer. And we tend to buy in and believe what the computer tells us. But understand, these trends that uh, and, 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 and practices that have gotten people interested in the supernatural are not trends or practices that were happened by just simply by accident. Man just didn't get involved in this just because he had a fascination for it. This is part of the strategy of the devil. Because what you need to understand, saints, is the devil does not want a supernatural rejecting world. Let me say it again. The devil does not want a supernatural rejecting world. He wants this world to believe in the supernatural. As a matter of fact, the devil doesn't even want a religious rejecting world. He just wants a world that will accept religion based on his standard of what religion is. He wants a religious rejecting world he doesn't want a religious rejecting world, but he does want a world that rejects the, the, the gospel and rejects God's uh, opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus Christ because he understands that if he doesn't get us to reject that, his plan and his purpose will not be accomplished. So part of his task, even though even while he doesn't want the world not to be religious and he doesn't want it not to believe in supernaturally, into the supernatural, what he wants to do, he understands his first strategy is he has to discredit the Bible and discredit Christianity. So the purpose of discrediting Christianity and the Bible is he put things next to it that claim to have same supernatural power to make us doubt whether or not the Bible is credible or not. Even today with the trend that going toward our world, we don't think the scripture is relevant to our culture and to our time. Many of our young people reject the Bible because they don't think it's relevant and they don't think that it fits in to what they want, what life is all about, or deals with the issue of life where they're at. That's only because we as the church have failed to teach it and practice it the way it's supposed to be. But the enemy is intending on discrediting the Bible, and he uses these practices of the occult to do that. So what are the practices? Let me show you with you what the practices are. First one I already mentioned to you is, the, is the astrology. Astrology, uh, primarily horoscopes. Some of y'all read jobs before you left home this morning. Let me tell you what the horoscope is. Horoscope is a chart of the heavens showing the relative position of the sun, the moon, and the planets, and the ascendant and mid-heaven signs of the zodiac at a specific moment in time. The goal of your horoscope is to help you believe that the sun, moon, and planets 
along with the zodiac signs, have some influence on your present and your future. That's the purpose of your horoscope, that not you would believe in God, you believe in the sun, moon, and the plants. That not you would believe that God has influence in your life, that you believe these planets, these moons, the sun, and these zodiac signs have influence in your life. Listen, some folks believe so strongly in their horoscope, but whatever their horoscope say don't do, they don't do. They do. They operate in literal fear that if they defy their horoscope, whatever is going to happen to them is going to happen. So they live their lives according to the fear that the horoscope creates. It says according, listen, according to the astrology, the sign that you were born under has influence on your destiny. If you're Aries or you're Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, or Capricorn. Somehow, the, who would the sign you were born under and how the moon and the stars line up with the zodiac sign have an influence on your destiny. Back in the day when I was growing up, one of the popular things is in my, in my age back in the 70s, to know, know your sign. To know your sign. Everybody, I'm Capricorn. I'm, I'm, I'm Cancer. And then we all, you know, you know which signs can't go along with what signs. And if you this sign, you this way. If you that sign, you this way. If you that sign, you this way. And, and, and you walk around believing it. You tell them, yeah, that's how I am. I am just like that. Yeah, that's, that's right. I'm, I'm Capricorn. I'm stubborn. I am stubborn. I am I'm stubborn. And Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. And you go, um. Uh, Bible says you're free and got power, and you go, oh. You don't go around and tell people, I'm fearfully abundantly made, but you go around and tell them I'm a Capricorn. And so these, these, this issue of astrology has been used by the enemy to divert us from our belief in a sovereign God who declares and says he's true. But we'd rather believe the lie of the, cap, of the, of the astrologists than the truth of the Bible. And listen, let me, let, let me say this. Let me say this very plainly and very clearly. This is a false belief. Matter of fact, this is the belief that God warned you not to get involved. False Christ and false prophets. This is a part of that false doctrine that the enemy infiltrates in our society to try to get us to believe. That there's, when we buy into this and we live by this, you need to understand you are buying into a false belief and a false doctrine and a false teaching. Because astrologers, soothsayers, sorcerers have no more power or even, even greater power than God. God shows you time and time again how he has thwart the power of, of astrologers and sorcerers and, and, and soothsayers. How do I know? Go to Daniel chapter 1. Remember when Daniel was taken to Babylon and Babylon was going to orientate Daniel and those three boys and make them like Babylonians? Well, they were going to do that one or two ways, through education and through diet. Well, Daniel decided they wasn't going to change their diet. And he challenged the eunuch by telling him, we ain't going to eat the food from the king's table. We're going to eat our food. Well, the man said, well, I don't know how that's going to work, but they let him do it. The Bible says that when Daniel and them ate that food the way God told them they ate that food, when the time was up and they were tested, they were 10 times smarter than the astrologers, the soothsayers, and the sorcerers. Hang done. God thrust them all the time because in the very next chapter, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he woke up from the dream terrified. He called his astrologers, his soothsayers, his fortune tellers, and all of his sorcerers and said, I had a dream. And I need y'all to tell me what my dream was and then tell me what it meant. And they said, wait a minute. What you say? No, you need to tell me what my dream was and then you need to tell me what it meant. What you mean what it was? We don't know what you dream. He said, you soothsayers, astrologers, and sorcerers, you better tell me what my dream was. 
Y'all got power? And they said, well, king, no king in all the earth has ever asked astrologer or soothsayer or sorcerer to do what you ask. He said, well, I tell you what, if you don't tell me my dream and tell me what it means, I'm going to kill all of you. Bible said Daniel was uh, hanging out in his crib praying and heard about it. And Daniel said, what's up? They said, Daniel, do you hear what the king going to do? What? He going to kill all of us. What do you mean kill all of us? He said, well, you part of us, bro. They said he going to kill us because he had this dream, and he ain't going to tell us what it is. And then he wants you to tell not only what it is, but what it means. Daniel said, oh, really? He said, yeah. Daniel said, let me go talk to this brother. He went and talked to Nebuchadnezzar, and he found out exactly what Nebuchadnezzar said. Daniel said, well, hold on, hold on. Okay, no problem. No problem. It was a God I serve. He able. So, so, so. Let me go check with him. I'll be back with you. Daniel wouldn't pray. God gave him the dream, vision. I don't know the dream, but what it meant. Daniel went back and told the king. God's power again demonstrated over the soothsayers. Sorcerers and 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 astrologers, they couldn't even know the dream. God revealed the dream to Daniel. Daniel told the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Not need to tell him what he dreamed. He told him what it meant. Because listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, greater is He. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. And Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter forty-seven. That astrologers, soothsayers, and fortune tellers are going to be the stubble in God's fire on judgment day. That's what that's what that's what Isaiah said. It's going to be part of the stubble he uses to get the fire to blaze. He's going to throw the astrologers, soothsayers, and fortune tellers in the fire on judgment day. And then he warns us and he forbids us and he tells us that astrology and any form of divination is expressly forbidden in Scripture for God's people to practice in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. First tool the devil uses to distract us is astrology. Second occult practice is fortune telling. Fortune telling is simply a practice designed to interpret the future events and characterize specific traits via seemingly illogical and irrational means. Oftentimes, fortune tellers will use your horoscope to tell your fortune. They use tarot cards to tell your fortune. They will use numerology. Some of us so in the church practice numerology, you know the numbers. And methods designed to interpret what they call physical traits or characteristics such as palm reading. They look at the lines in your hands and can tell you how long you're going to live. Amen. Some of us believe that stuff real serious, too. I mean, you got somebody holding your hand talking about this line right here says you're going to have a long life. Really? We laugh at that. You got people. There's some folks at the palm said right now, you in church, they're the palm reader. And somebody looking at their head. And then you walk in there, they got all these little charts all over the place and all these little fingers, and they got all this little stuff you can't hardly understand, and they make you make you think they smart. And all is a part of it's all part of the all part of the, of the facade to deceive you, to dupe you to trick you into thinking that there is some power out there that's equal to God's. Come on. Because that's exactly what they're trying to tell you. That you don't have to trust God. You can trust these powers. They're, they're just as good as God's or even better. Let them look at the lines in your hand. Let me show you. And the Bible, again, reminds us that he forbids us to be a part of these kinds of practices. But not only is it there the issue of fortune telling, there's the issue of what they call meditation cults. 
meditation, and one of the most popular meditation cult is the pra cult practice is transcendental meditation. Matter of fact, adherents of adherents of transcendental meditation believe that they can uh, get to a place of deep meditation where they can leave this realm and go into another realm. That they can they can actually meditate and be put themselves in a space or in a in a, in, a, in a level of existence that is different from the current existence that they have. Many of the adherents of transcendental meditation believe that as they practice it and as they get involved in it, as they uh, uh, meditate on their mantras and and, and 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 focus on the things that they're supposed to focus on, they can get to a level in their transcendental meditation practice where they even believe they can fly. For those on the outside listening, and if you're around somebody who's at who's a transcendental meditation, and it and 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 they reach that level where they think they can fly, you on the outside listening to them on the inside in the practice of meditation will will hear a lot of bumping going around, and you hear boom boom. You thinking that they're just jumping around? Well, in their minds, they're flying when they're just bouncing around the room. But they have been convinced and believe that they get to this level of meditation prowess and ability that they can leave their body and they can actually fly. Research has been done on trans transcendental meditation over the last few last three years, three year study, and the effects of me transcendental meditation, the, the, the tester, the researcher said, is disastrous and devastating. This is what they say happens to those who would practice transcendental meditation. He says those who are would practice transcendental meditation tend to make tra tra transcendental meditation tends to make a person skeptical of God. That's the first part of the practice. Makes them skeptical of God because in transcendental meditation you are taught that you can become equal with God if not like God himself. So you become skeptical of God. You doubt any concept of life after death, because in transcendental meditation, if you reach a level of meditation that you can literally leave this world and go into another, you don't have to die. And then the aspect of it is that transcendental meditation encourages you to discard any other belief you had about anything before you delve into transcendental meditation. God reminds us the only thing we ought to meditate on is the word. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 said, this book, you shall meditate, and this book shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it both day and night. Hallelujah. That you might be observed to do what it says. Psalmist reminds me that it is your word that is my meditation. That if, if there's something you need to focus on and something you need to work on, is you need to meditate. And every believer should meditate on the Word because just like food, you, it's not the food that gives you the strength you need. What really makes the food what you have after you eat it is the process of digestion. Digestion is what breaks the food down so it can go to your body to give you the strength that you need. Just taking the food ain't enough. Digestion has to place. Well, well, just taking the Word ain't enough. You get the Word, that's one thing. But when you get it in your spirit, meditation is the digestive system of the spirit, and that gets it into every aspect of your being. Then it comes out in your living. But as long as you ain't meditating on the word, you take it in, you, by the time you get out of it, the devil will snatch it away from you. Yeah, we, yeah, we ought to meditate. But we ought to meditate on the word. Not only is astrology, not only is fortune telling, not only is meditation cults a distraction, direct Satan worship is a part of the occult. I can't leave that out because there is a direct, there are folks who worship the devil. And you need to know that there is a form of satanic worship. People who believe under the misguided understanding that somehow if they worship the devil and they go to hell, they're going to be partners with Satan in hell. They're going to co-rule with the devil in hell because they've been convinced that hell is Satan's kingdom. And that ain't what the Bible said. The Bible says, Matthew, hell was prepared for the punishment of Satan and his demons. Satan ain't going to rule hell. Satan's going to be punished in hell. 
But the devotees and followers of satanic worship are on the misconception that somehow if they worship the devil, they want to go to hell because they're going to rule with him in hell, which is a prime example of the height of the deception that Satan perpetrates upon man. Because when it comes to Satan worship, everything in Satan worship and its rights are the opposite of Christian belief. In the Satan worship, they have an upside-down cross. In Satan worship, they recite the Lord's Prayer backwards. In Satan worship, they have a baby on the altar, but it's a, a dead baby, a symbol of a dead baby, and they have a sign and costumes of goats rather than lambs. Everything is the opposite. Yet God reminds us we shall have no other gods before him. Exodus 23. There's only one God, God alone. We already learned. If you didn't hear about the devil, uh, go to the message on the devil. You find out he is not a supernatural. He is a created being. And he has his power. Is not, he does not have the opposite power of God. His power is no match for God whatsoever. If there is an opposite power he has is of Michael and, uh, and Michael and Gabriel. Their power may be the same, but as far as God is concerned, Satan is not an equal to God. No way, no how, whatsoever. Jesus said, and I'll tell you again, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. I don't know about you. That's fast. And when Satan decided to take the throne of God and try to usurp the kingdom, Jesus said he thought it one minute, next minute, like lightning, he was out of heaven. Wasn't even a fight. God just flicked a fly off his shoulder, and he went into the, into the atmosphere around the world. And now we have to deal with him. And listen, and, and listen, and he has to deal with us. <laughs> because the Bible reminds us that we have authority over him, too. Amen. Next practice, witchcraft. Next distraction, witchcraft. Servants of Satan are involved in casting spells and incantations against those who believe in good and those who believe in God. We wanted our country, um, why I get, let me put it this way. One of the most influential television programs that got people involved in witchcraft and, and made us believe that witchcraft was something safe for us to get involved in was the TV program, the sitcom called Bewitched. Bewitched made us believe that there were good witches and bad witches. Bewitched made us believe that witches can use their power for good and help people. And, that, and, and the bad witches were, 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 were the bad ones that they would fought against. Bewitched made us believe something that the Bible did not teach. And that witchcraft was acceptable, and it is all right if you use the white magic rather than the black magic. And I don't know where that came from. That came from the mind of man, because there's nowhere in the Scripture. God calls witches witches. He didn't say dictionary between no good or bad. He said witches are the servants of Satan, witches. Okay. And so the Bible tells us that we need to avoid witchcraft. We need to stay away from witchcraft. Matter of fact, Deuteronomy, uh, as I get ready to close out this message, starts with verse 18. I'm going to read this one as we get to verses 10, 13. It says this, and there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That's talking about child sacrifices, burning their babies. One who practices witchcraft. Witchcraft, period, is is evil in God's eyes and an abomination to God, who are soothsayers, who call upon demons, who, are, who interpret omens like Ouija boards and selling signs, who are sorcerers, who conjure spells, or who are mediums or, 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 or spiritualists. In other words, people who talk to the spirits. I think I skipped that one. Spiritualism is another one. Yeah, uh, um, I'll go back to that. But who... Um, who are spiritualists, who call upon demons or call upon the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and you shall be blameless before the Lord. All of these things are an abomination to the Lord. 
and they defile your spirit. That's the intent. And God tells us to stay away from these. I don't care if they seem good, because the goal of them seeming good is to dupe you and to get into the practice so that they can influence your life and keep you from experiencing the presence and the power of God. I, I mentioned spiritualism, and I think I skipped that one. Let me go right back to that one, because that's the uh, system of belief of religious practices based on supposed communication with the spirits of the dead. We've got popular spiritualists in our world today. We have them on sitcoms. They've been on television programs. They, they, they tell people that you talk to their dead parent that went away, and then they have these moments where they say, he's talking to me, and he said this about you, and then these folks go, oh, and they start crying, and everybody fall out, and people go, ooh. You got musicians and all these different kinds of folks who perform these kinds of magic things. They're all in, uh, all of it is a part of the occult practice. All of it is influenced by the enemy. Do you understand the enemy can't tell your future, but he surely can tell your past. And if you listen carefully to all these spiritualists, they're always talking about something that already happened. So it ain't no problem for a demon to come and whisper in their ear and say, well, so-and-so. And then you hear where well, something happened in your past. Nobody knew that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, you're right. Nobody knew that except the people that died. But the reason why they know that because the demon done told them. And they tell you that lie. Well, your loved one just told me you used to do this and you used to like that. And that's where you went. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now you believe they got some kind of power. Now you're going to pay money for them to tell you stuff that ain't real and ain't true, and that lie, that fear is going to govern your life. Whether you have a God who already told you what your future is going to be like if you put it in his hands. It ain't no guessing game. If you put your faith in Christ, you guaranteed to spend eternity with him in heaven. Well, that's where you want to go, ain't it? Well, trust God. But the Bible reminds us, as he says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 30, give no regard to mediums or familiar spirits, for if, and do not seek after them. Why? Because they defile you. Because to, 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 they will defile you. I am the, to be defiled. The goal of the enemy, if he can't keep you from getting saved, is, is, is if, he, if you get saved, is to defile your spirit so that your spirit does not function the way God would intend for you to function in obedience and faith in him. All of these practices are distractions. All of these practices are false. What they portray to have, they don't have. It's an illusion. It may seem real for a moment, but the goal of it is to get you entrapped in it so that what really makes it real is not what they practice. It's the fear they instill in you that makes you believe if you do anything opposite, what they say is going to come true. And it's more you make it happen than more than they cause it to happen. God does not operate in fear, nor does he cause us to be afraid. God calls us to life. And God calls us to hope, and God calls us to redemption, and God calls us to prosperity in him. I close this message with this verse. You've heard it before. Let me say it to you again. It bears repeating. Behold, I give you authority to trample on the serpent and the scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing you get this? Nothing shall by any means hurt you. He may threaten. He may blow up like a blowfish and make you think he's going to wipe you out. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Add Isaiah, no weapon formed against you. None will prosper. 
But it begins with faith in him. We are in spiritual warfare all the time. Enemy is relentless in his attacks against you and your family. When you think you got a break, that's the time you need to be vigilant. He stands ready to attack. But listen, that's not words to be create anxiety. Those are not words to create fear. And those are not words to create frustration. I warn you with these words because they're just words to remind you to use the authority that you've been given. Bible says, if you resist him, he will flee. Amen. It don't take a great effort on your part to resist him. It already requires your faith to believe in what God's word says. And God does the rest. I stand on his word. God does the rest. Amen. Just use the biblical examples. See what God did for them when they stood on the word. Not much effort on their part. (laughs) Not much effort on their part at all. All they had to do was stand on the word. And God showed up. Amen? And the Bible says he's not a respecter of person. So if he did it for them, he'll do it for you. If you stand like they stand, he'll show up for them, for you, like he showed up for them. Amen. If if you believe like they believe, the same power he demonstrated in their lives will be the same power he'll demonstrate in your lives. He's not a God who shows favoritism. He's just a God who responds to faith. Without it, it's impossible to please him. But by it, the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. All he wants you to do is believe. Warfare is around us. But be not worried, saints of God. You are already victorious in Jesus.